So, last lecture, hopefully you learned a little bit about Darwin. Um, Grant, you know I have a short history of nearly everything. If you want to know a little bit more about his backstory and how he ended up on a ship, because uh, his dad apparently didn't like him. Just kidding. But today we're going to talk about the evolution of life. Remember, evolution is meaning change over time. So keep that in mind as we go through these lecture slides. But variation, as I said in the last lecture, variation is one of those driving forces of evolution. Uh, random variations exist in a population, just like you have some people that have blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, hazel eyes, like there's all these different variations. However, variation increases the chances that some members of a population will survive and reproduce under changing environmental conditions. So the environment is the driving force behind natural selection. I cannot stress that enough. Variation, environment, natural selection. But there's also, with natural selection, there's also artificial selection. Like, let's say if you're a dog breeder, Dog breeders, that is artificial selection because you're trying, you're selecting certain traits that you want to have in your dog. Um, and even like pumpkins, uh, corn, like corn typically is actually like, look, it has different, different colors. Uh, but like the corn that you get in a store is actually artificially selected where it's like, oh, we want this type of yellow corn. Or even if you get like all white corn, you're selecting those favorable traits. But in natural selection, it's like, okay, you have traits and those traits are naturally selected. It's like, okay, you're able to use that trait in your environment. So organisms with favorable variations survive, reproduce, and then pass on those traits to the next generation. They pass on those variations. However, uh, if you're an individual and you're unsuccessful, like your traits are just like, eh, not gonna, gonna help you out in that environment, you're not gonna survive. Um, and I, I was, I'm going to be cautious when I say that for the fact, it's not like, oh man, I have a trait and I'm not going to survive, like I literally don't survive in that environment, like, oh man, I'm dead the next day. It's like, ultimately, that trait that you have is not going to get passed on to the next generation. You're not going to produce necessarily a lot of offspring or maybe you won't find the mate that likes you. It's like, oh, can't find a mate because I don't have the traits that are needed. So they're less suitable. And eventually, over time, that trait that they have is going to disappear from the population because it's not selected naturally. So this is why sometimes when you hear evolution or natural selection, it's survival of the fittest. It's like, are you the most fit for that environment? And if you are the most fit, then guess what? You're going to survive. So like in the case of these beetles, uh, what do you think will happen over time to this beetle population? So like we have these little, these birds and they're like, oh, we found green beetles are our favorite. I love green beetles. But think about it. What's going to happen to to this beetle population? You have some brown ones, but then you have green ones. Let's actually take a look. So generations later, still eating the green beetles because those are our favorite. But now we have some more of these these brown beetles coming in until eventually more generations, we don't have green beetles anymore. Because green beetles, being a green beetle wasn't a good thing. That was not a, a, a trait that was advantageous. Uh, it wasn't beneficial to the beetle. Because green beetles have been selected against. So brown beetle, that was a trait that was, that was actually beneficial in this environment. So the brown beetles, they flourish, now they're everywhere. And hey, maybe the birds ended up liking brown beetles after some time, or maybe they just found a different food source. But then they come to adaptations. So an adaptation is like a physical, chemical, or behavioral trait that increases one's ability to survive. And there's different types of adaptations. So like mimicry is one, where if, let's say you're an individual, where you have an advantage because let's say you look like a different individual. Like you look like a individual of a different species. So there's like the scarlet king snake and then there's the coral snake. Uh, there's also uh, the monarch, part of monarch butterfly and its counterpart. You know the orange and black butterflies? I can never remember what the other one is. 
but it's like one tastes really, really bad. So the other one actually does taste good, but because it looks like the one that tastes bad, like no one's going to eat it. So something that's an advantage because you look like something that no one wants to mess with. Camouflage. Camouflage is also a really good one because you have you're blending in with your environment. Uh, camouflage is typically one of those things that like there's a lot of different species uh, that do the whole camouflage thing. And the example that I want to give is there's these moths, the peppered moths in England, um, where if you look over here, like here's a tree, you can't even see that moth. It's like right there. But uh, we had the Industrial Revolution come around, and eventually the peppered moth. Like, you could see it. It was no longer camouflage. So the population of pepper moth went down. The regular moths were able to survive because of the fact that, like, now, Industrial Revolution, everything's like, covered with soot and it's dirty. And now you can see pepper moth. And then we come to the evidence for evolution. Like, we said this before in a previous lecture, but um, in terms of adaptations and, and uh, variations and whatnot. So we have the fossil record anatomical evidence, embryological evidence, and DNA. How does this come into play? Well, in our fossil record, remember, fossils can show how things change over time. Like if I had a collection of horse, horse ancestors, uh, we can see how over time the, the hoof, the, the, what am I thinking of, hoof, the forearm, arm, leg, um, has changed over time, like the bones have extended. Eventually there was like the, the loss of an appendage or the fusion of appendage actually, because if you see, you have B, four, three, and two, like these are all the, the structures, like start off with the orohippus, then um, you have the myohippus where now B has become um, miniaturized, that's the best um, explanation I can give. You still have the other appendages, but like then the third one becomes more prominent, and then eventually you have the full-on hoof where the third appendage is the main one, and then two and four have become uh, reduced, and then appendage five is basically obsolete. Then we have anatomical evidence, and the first thing I want to point out is the concept of hom homologous structures, I can say this, uh, which you have structures that are similar in structure, like actual structure, but that's because they have a shared ancestry. And that's like when we were first talking about uh, embryological, not embryological, homologous structures as evidence for evolution. Uh, the human, cow, whale, and bat, where we have that forearm, where we ulna, radius, there's certain parts of that bone that are very similar. But, like arm of a human, forearm of a cow, the fin of a whale, the wing of a bat, all different purposes, but same basic structure. So bird wing, human arm, whale fluke, same structure, different purpose. Uh, then we have analogous structures where you have these differences in structure because you have a different ancestry. So we have human, bird, porpoise, elephant. Uh, might have similar function, like we have the arm, like people normally do compare arms of humans to so like the wings of birds, like something that like, we can do things with. Um, but similar in function, but that's because they evolved to the environment. So bird wing, grasshopper wing, different, but it's still a wing. Uh, vestigial structures, so these are these structures that over time, um, they aren't used. So it's kind of like, it's almost like that you don't use it, you lose a concept, but not really. So like in the case of the snake, um, the snake hips, the vestigial femurs, not really necessary for the snake. Uh, even the femur and pelvis of a whale, like, they have them, but it's not like it's very, it's not a necessary part of their, their overall, the structure. Uh, embryological evidence, so we compare how these organisms develop over time in the embryo, helps us determine those, em uh, those evolutionary relationships. 
And DNA evidence is a really big one because you can compare the DNA of certain organisms and see how they're related. So like in the scrub jay, you have the western scrub jay, and then this beautiful thing over here is the Florida scrub jay, which unfortunately is in danger. But we can find those hidden relationships because of the fact that we've compared their DNA. And now the next lecture will be mechanisms of evolution.